I'm part of the Social Inclusion, Hope and Recovery project. Uh, we are a project that's been running in Lambeth for about a decade, which is pretty amazing. And we support people in Lambeth who are experiencing psychosis and have severe and enduring mental health sy um, symptoms. Uh, we were started based on a feasibility study. Uh, we were a redesigned service and people asked service users and people what they wanted and we were created from their wishes, which is quite nice. Uh, our aims at Sharp have always been to increase social inclusion, to decrease distressing symptoms, to reduce relapse, um, promote healthy living, and most importantly, to enable new and innovative practice. And we've lived up to those things, um, hopefully, as you can see from our impact assessment. We are, we are SLAM. We are part of SLAM. We are one, but we are many. Okay, so I've been asked this question a lot of times, surprisingly, which is, why would you do an impact assessment? Um, and if you have a look over in the corner, it's, we, we do collect a lot of data. Um, we have a lot of outcome measures. We, as services, collect a lot of information about patients that go into a giant black vortex of things that we don't really ever see or use. Um, and we also have some big questions in the current climate, like are we actually doing what we set out to achieve? Um, so we decided that we would do an impact assessment as a service because we, we wanted to use evidence collected in a meaningful way and reach a much wider audience, which also includes our service users themselves. Uh, we wanted to see if we actually make a difference. Um, it's a climate of budget cuts, and if you're going to make a change, you should know what changes you're making and the impact that's going to have on the people in the system. The other thing is that it's about affecting systems changes and challenging what we think about ourselves. Are we so good at getting paired outcome scores? What's going on? How do we record our data? You'd be surprised. Sometimes you think you're just taking a number and putting it in a system and then one day you go to pull that data out and you realise it's the wrong number. You weren't measuring what you needed to measure. Um, and the other thing is we need to look at the quality of care we're delivering and not just the numbers. And impact is about more than just the number, it's about the whole story. So I'm Boris and I'm from Unboxed. Um, we're a digital agency and we try to help organizations like Sharp um, you know, uh, develop some innovative digital solutions. Um, in this case, we work, we were approached by Sharp to help them out with this impact assessment. And we try to go um, to kind of develop this impact assessment in um, I suppose with a similar, in a similar way that we approach most innovation projects, which is trying to develop a kind of iter iterative approach um, to developing the impact assessment in this case. So there were three elements, I suppose, to this approach that we kind of cycled through. Um, one of them, and you're going to hear a bit more about it in a, in a minute, it was developing, was trying to identify um, and valid, validate outcomes. So what kind of things is Sharp as a service actually aiming to achieve? Um, that was essential to try to uh, do this impact assessment because you need to kind of understand uh, what is it that you're trying to achieve in the first place to understand if you've actually achieved it, right? Um, so we did that through something called the theory of change, which you, which you will see a bit more about um, in a minute. The second thing, so after that, one of the things we did is we went out and we tried to find out the data, right? We tried to find out the data within the service. As you have seen, there's a lot of data in um, various folders and you know, uh, hidden closets and red cupboards. Books. Red books. Red books. Red books. Red books. Lots of red books. Yes. Black books. Black books, yes. Um, and we, so we did that, but we also went out and uh, tried to find some new data. So we <coughs> went out and spoke to a number of service users. We, we went out and spoke to the service staff uh, to really try to understand um, what the service is all about and what um, the impact is that it's making on, the, on its users. And the third thing that's crucial, I think, if you're about to do an impact assessment, is you need to understand how all the data that you gathered and analyzed is then going to feed back into the service. Because I suppose the only reason to do an impact assessment is to actually improve the service. Um, and in order to do that, 
I suppose, on an ongoing basis, we try to do this iterative approach, right? So we try to understand uh, what the outcomes are, try to do some research, and try to fit that back into the service. And again, after that, see what came out of that, and maybe adapt the outcomes, adapt, do some new research, and again, fit that back into the service. Now, I was talking about uh, the outcomes, right? So how do we go about identifying the outcomes? Um, we use something called the theory of change, which is really a process where you first question yourself, what is it that you're trying to achieve? And that might be something that's set either by trust itself, um, so there are some outcomes that are definitely identified by the trust, but also some outcomes that are intrinsic to the service itself. Um, in our case, and I'm, I'm sorry because this is really difficult to read right there, but there, uh, you're going to see more of that later. Uh, so there are two main types of outcomes that we're after here. So one of them was reduced cost, and that's, I suppose, always, uh, especially these days, a very big um, driver for innovation. And the second thing we were after was try to identify data for uh, increased social inclusion and well-being for the service users of Sharp. Um, and then once we had those outcomes, we tried to go back from that and map those outcomes back to the service activities or the interventions that they're, um, that they're running. So there are a number of things that Sharp is doing, and those, all of those things have certain outputs, and all those outputs lead you know, through intermediary stages to certain outcomes. Um, by developing this picture through you know, a workshop with, with Sharp, uh, it makes it easier for us to understand how these things are linked and where we can find the evidence. Evidence, right? That's a... Does everyone know about evidence? Does everyone know about the levels of evidence? Yeah. yeah so something, something that we're going to talk about a bit more later as well is, so Sharp is already I mean, it's been around for 10 years, so it's already an established service. Uh, what we quite often deal with uh, at Unbox, for example, is developing new services as well. Um, and that's always a challenge because when you're developing something new, you don't really have any data to support and validate that service or the intervention. And so this is just, a, I suppose, a depiction of what kind of evidence we might want to be looking for, depending on how old and how established the service is. Uh, and this is something that's been developed by Nesta for particularly um, this kind of uh, situation, right? So when you have a very new intervention with um, a low number of users, maybe you're just running some tests, some pilots, some prototyping. Um, the crucial thing in the level one is that you can describe what you do and why it matters logically, coherently, and convincingly. So basically at this point, you're really just describing. It's your operational policy. It's you're about to start a service and you write an operational policy, but you have no idea yeah, and, and what the results of that will be. And developing the theory of change. And obviously, as soon as you have that, you need to capture some data. So level two is about capturing data that shows positive change, but you cannot confirm you caused this, right? So at some point, you will have some data, but the causality might not be that clear. And I think the thing that we all try to get to as soon as possible is the level three, where you can demonstrate causality using a control or a comparison group. But I will say that is very difficult when you're working in, in real time to actually prove causality um, outside of a research project, really. But that's what our aim is, yeah. And that's kind of what we try to do with Sharp as well. Um, there are higher levels, but for those higher levels, it's really necessary to have a service that runs on multiple locations or with a higher number of users, so it's really difficult to get to level five. Not that easy at all. Um, and so that's the theory, right? But how do you go about finding the data in the real world? Yeah, so there, there are some amazing graphs and, and, you know, and some of the example of, of data really made visual. Um, but finding the data and the, the sources and the skills, um, the skilled people to actually analyze it is getting harder and harder. You'd think it'd be really easy to find these amazing people that use SQL and can like, you know, just come up with amazing stat statistical frames of reference and put everything in. But it's actually, they're gems and I was lucky enough to find um, Professor Alistair MacDonald who was our outgoing Head of Trust Outcomes to help um, decipher the data and take it um, from our electronic patient journey system and make it speak and tell its story. Um, I guess 
that's the other thing. It's about finding ways to make it robust. I, I tried really the best way possible to do an independent analysis of the data, which meant that I went to someone and said, here's a giant database, here's bed days, here's hospital admissions, here's the caseload. How can we somehow make a start at getting to level three and comparing us with people who don't necessarily see us? Um, that, that just, you know, literally is the tip of the iceberg and then you've got the triangulation, like you try and find other points of data or other things that shape that story. So it, it becomes uh, interviewing people to see whether or not there is any kind of a lead for causality or what people's experiences are. Um, it's about getting that next mixed methods approach um, in place because that can be quite intimidating and scary and might not actually mean that much unless you actually have the stories to back it up. Um, and then I'm a big fan of patient reported outcome measures because I really think it's important that the patient sees the change and identifies the change and notices if there's been improvement. I also am a firm believer in using standardised <coughs> measures which we're not always that great at doing. They exist, but we get really, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this, we get really caught up on, I'm an occupational therapist and I wanna use this tool. And it's like, yeah, that's great and it's useful, but it may not always be comparable. It may not always actually, you, I, I'm really big on let's find things we can all use and let's speak a common language that makes sense to our patients and to everyone, so yeah. There are two things you're always after, right? So it's the comparison group that Sarah was talking about. So yes. there's the sharp service data and the comparison group. There's always the pre and post data that you have. So that's the two things you're after, right? Yeah. Um, but more about that later, perhaps. Yeah. I think once we have all the data and we kind of made all those nice graphs and stuff, I know this event is called digital healthcare, right? So we haven't said the word digital yet. So digital, digital, digital. <laughs> <laughs> um, no! <laughs> How do we make the evidence engaging? And of course, yeah, digital, right? Yeah. Uh, digital is not the solution to everything, but we said what are the tools at our disposal and maybe why not make it into an interactive experience? Um, so instead of just showing a bunch of numbers and tables and, and charts, we said, let's try to really tell the story of the users through kind of examples of lived experience, through making uh, video evidence of you know, what the service looks like and hear, listen to the stories that the service users have to tell about the service, right? So we've kind of tried to really employ this mixed method approach, not just to have more robust evidence, but also to make the evidence more engaging so that people are actually able to listen through yes. uh, to the stories and see for themselves what the service is. I'll put about. my hand up and say, I don't want to read another 20 page report. Oh. I'm just not going to, and in this modern age, most people aren't. So we need to find ways of making it you know, something that people actually want to engage with and want to look at. And even if they click on one tab, it's easier than find it, you know, in an easy and quick manner. Yeah. We also really tried by doing that, we also tried to get um, everyone involved in the production of the impact assessment itself. So we tried to talk to service users and, you know, they were very grateful. We, did, we didn't even try, we did. We, we did, spoke yeah. to service users and we spoke yeah. to everyone as well as service staff, and basically everyone was kind of part of co-producing this impact assessment, which I think was a, <coughs> um, a, you know, a separate out outcome in itself. This is it, right? It's basically, it's a website, um, and you know, there is a URL here. If you want to go to it, you can write it down and then you know, have a look for yourselves later. Um, I'm going to show it again at the end, just so you can copy it in. Um, but yeah, this is it. So it's a website, uh, and Basically, one of the main features you're going to see on the homepage is basically it's done based on the theory of change we've developed. So it lists a number of different activities that Sharp is doing, as well as the number of um, different outcomes. So we've tried to really simplify that and just group it into the main groups. Uh, so you can see that the main outcomes we're presenting here is reduced cost of services, as well as the increased social inclusion and well-being. Uh, and obviously, yeah, we've tried to make it nice and kind of put some animations, but also, more importantly, each of these things is a button leading to a um, kind of more detailed information about the specific section. Uh, 
And one of the things to mention, I suppose, we've tried to use a lot of uh, quotes, for example, from interviews with service users. Uh, so this is kind of part of that uh, qualitative evidence, um, as well as try to, as much as possible, um, use uh, videos with service users and service staff to kind of make it more engaging. So this is this part. Coming to shop for me has been great. It's, I've enjoyed it. I've very much enjoyed it. I've enjoyed all the people that I've spoke to in groups and one to one. I've, I've, it's been a, an excellent experience. Doing things I never thought I'd be able to do. I'm not confident enough to do it. Um, the issue of the team was very good as well because it was just keeping active, it was a regular routine, lots of people meeting up and basically doing something they love doing. It's been really uh, a fantastic place to work. It's a nice feeling coming to be with the team um, because the people that I know, some of the staff I've known a long time, it's just like a family situation really, it's very welcoming. This is another good example of, of belonging, of, of making us a part of, of what the Sharp do, you know, including us in videos and, and making our, our experiences heard in a way that can help us and, and other people. I found that part that Dean is awesome. I found that part so moving because I didn't even think when I was interviewing service users, like I just didn't think that that would even mean anything. Like, I didn't even think that it means a lot to ask somebody to participate. And I, I forget, because that I just think that's normal, but obviously for people, there's a power in even including them in these kind of projects, um, which I think is important. Um, so I suppose that part is really more about um, you know, telling the story, getting people engaged. There's always the need for hard data, so we also provide the hard data for the kind of reduced cost of services and the uh, increased social inclusion and well-being. And I'm not going to go too much into this. There's a lot of reading if you want to do it. It's quite, um, I suppose, detailed. Um, just to show a few things, so how we try to get this data a little bit more engaging. I suppose we've done a few um, interactive elements, so you can kind of try to play with the data a little bit and try to uh, see what the data looks like for different time periods, for example. Um, we have tried to really keep it very simple, so on some level it seems um, maybe even too simple to someone who's used to looking at data in you know, big spreadsheets, uh, but really try to make, uh, kind of just to get the main messages across, of so trying to really emphasize the big numbers we wanted uh, to show. Um, and obviously for everyone who's interested in a bit more detail, there's always uh, you know, some additional level of detail to really understand what, uh, what the process was and what, what the analysis was behind that data. Yeah. And, and these are, just to say, because I had to do budgeting for this, I used very conservative estimates. So I mean, like for me, for me, the, for me I think, what it shows is that there's something there that needs to be explored further before you change it. Like that obviously a difference is being made and has been made over a decade and it's about how we, what we're doing that we need to do more of, what we're doing that we need to do less of and it's about unpacking that before you change it, I guess. That's what I would say. So I picked this picture because I just feel like this is what it's like when you do something and you're trying to give people information. <laughs> you are like, I have this amazing the impact assessment that I've done and, uh, and look at this data, isn't it incredible? And a few things happen <laughs> as part of that process. Uh, where, well, you, well you, you're really good at the analogy bit, but like basically, you end up improving your service and acknowledging weaknesses. So in order to find all the data, you need to look at people's sore spots and you actually need to look for it. And so when you look for it, you realise, oh my God, we've been recording this wrong the whole time. Or what happened in 2009? <laughs> or where did that, you know, and it is. But that, this is being human and this is being a service and this is doing amazing work. And, going through periods where you're very focused in the work and then, you know, having to look at, you know, changing of systems 
uh, we recorded it this way and then that way. And it's, it, it is, it, it actually brings up a lot about the system. And then I think what was great about our team is that we are able to own the things that we don't do 100% well. And then we go away and everyone goes, right, we have to get better at this. And I think everyone has been amazing at working hard to get paired scores, working hard to sort of capture things even better than previously. Um, the other thing is, like, this, I liked your analogy about Moses being able to have a direct conversation with God. Sometimes, as a uh, lowly NHS worker and not in the pyramid scheme, it's hard to have those conversations with senior members of staff who are making really important decisions about our service. And this impact assessment was a way of getting a foot in the door and actually interviewing, I guess, the most important people who are making those decisions and seeing what they thought about us and talking to them about what we were doing. And, and it was a really great way of opening up conversations and learning a lot. Um, so I did get a foot in the door with many, with God, and it was wonderful, and I made my Ten Commandments. Um, and then I will say the importance of timing. So take one, Moses comes down and everyone's partying and it's all gone to chaos. Uh, we do this impact assessment now, and then we come back to a restructuring and reorganisation and chaos, and you're holding up these, this ethos, in a way, this impact that you have in a conditions where sometimes it's, you just want to smash it on the ground and go, that's it, I'm done. And I think, like, timing is really important, but it's also... Uh, I think and I believe that if you do make an impact and if you and if that is there in, in stone, that's gonna stand. That that is your epitaph, that is the thing that stands beyond, you know, beyond anything, beyond any change is the impact that you make on people's lives. And I know that the trust uh, the trust now have the policy on changing lives and that's the title and I feel like I've after doing this impact assessment and working for my team for 10 years, I actually feel like we've lived that and we've done that for people. And not many people can actually say that about the services they work for, but I feel like we do. Yeah. I think another thing to emphasize here is that this is, as we showed in the beginning, it's an iterative process, right? And it's done quite like way. This was a very low budget project. And the point of this is to do it over and over and yeah. over again so you can always measure what the service is like and how it performs. So it's not set in stone as in the picture, right? It's actually yeah. something that's constantly evolving. Um, and, and with that in mind, right, it's also, I suppose, really important that you know that you're looking at the right information to make the big decisions. Yeah. I would ask, like, it's really strange that I'm the first person to look at EPJS in this way and try and draw data to look at comparison samples and look at what how services are performing. I feel like people that's the kind of data we should be looking at or outcome like outcome measures not I have I just don't know it feels to me sometimes like we're operating in the in a very like a past way of operating where we do clinical audits of notes and we randomly look at things and then it's not a very objective or methodical way to be making decisions or activity analysis. Like, I think we need to, we have all of this data, it's there, we now need to actually use it. That's what I think, to make those decisions. With that in mind, thank you very much. And uh, again, here is the link for everyone who wants to visit the website themselves. Uh, just write it down, write it in your browser. It should work on your phones, it should work on your computer. Um, if it doesn't, please let me know. And please give feedback, because we really welcome feedback. Because again, it's, it, it's iterative. And we love if it's user-friendly or if you like things about it. Um, and watch the videos, because I think they're super cool. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.